Good morning, brothers and sisters. May you each have a very happy and blessed Sabbath. As we return to the study that we've done these last several weeks in Zechariah 7, as we begin to focus today very much on Zechariah 7, 14, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for the wisdom that we will need to rightly divide the word of truth. Shall we now ask for his blessing and prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you that we may set aside so many things that we find to occupy our time during the week. Come to you, come before you, to learn and to worship you. We ask now, Father, for your guidance as we open your word. May these words have impact upon our hearts. May your will be done, and may your name be glorified. Please send your spirit to convict us of all sin. Direct us now in the path that you would have us to walk. I thank you for each one that are attending this study today, and for those that will view this later. Help us now to look, to learn, and to listen, so that we may more properly and truly represent your character in this world. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we are finishing with this last week, and it's worthy of recap. Men who have gone to great lengths in transgression, who have never confessed their sins, will seek to bring all the reproach possible upon those whom Satan has worked to destroy, but who have repented and humbled themselves before God, confessing their sins to the sin-pardoning Savior and receiving pardon. Men who have not repented of their sins and who have not received pardon will tantalize the truly repentant ones, repeating their wrongdoings <clears throat> to those who knew nothing of the wrong done. They accuse and condemn the repentant ones as if they themselves were guiltless. Brothers and sisters, have we seen this occurring today, yet even today? It has been shown me that the experience recorded in the third chapter of Zechariah is now being acted over and will continue to be while men making profession of cleanness refuse to humble the heart and confess their sins. So now, the third chapter of Zechariah was the vision of Joshua the high priest, where he stands clothed in filthy rags. So this written in letter 360 in 1906, and of course 360 is a number that just has no meaning whatsoever, is being written for this time, right? Mm -hmm. And that word tantalize means to torment. To torment, okay? So how many of us are seeing a situation where those that we love are tormenting us by trying to make us appear as unworthy before others? How many accusers must we face? And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in by his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. When they make their hearts as an adamant stone, when they make their hearts as a diamond, what are the two things that we can say about such a stone? What do we see when we consider this, that they have made their hearts as a diamond? First, as I consider this, they have made their hearts hard because a diamond is regarded as being a very hard mineral. The other part is a diamond is also quite reflective. But what are they reflecting? Are they reflecting Christ's character or are they reflecting their own? Their own. Amen, sister. 
And isn't it a shame that they are trying to reflect their character upon those that have confessed their sins? But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned. For they laid the pleasant land, the land of desire, desolate. What does this mean for us today? How can we apply this to what we are seeing at this point? Any thoughts? I'm thinking. Okay. But I don't have any any solid thoughts yet. Okay. Comment from the chat. A diamond, we are told, is highly compressed carbon. We are all comprised of plenty of carbon. Mrs. White continues. The work of fathers and mothers is to keep their children uncontaminated from the world. Now, in the studies that we've been doing each day, we have been going through the study not only of Samuel and Hannah, but of Eli and his sons. Note here that it is the joint work of fathers and mothers to keep their children uncontaminated from the world. Yet in the society that we find a lot in this world, we find single parents, mothers trying to do the job of both mother and father, sometimes father trying to do the job of mother and father. In trying to keep children uncontaminated from the world. The perspective of both is needed. In order to do this, it will be necessary to study the word of God and obtain a rich experience. You will feed upon rich food in studying the life and the lessons of Christ, in reading and in praying with the door of your heart open to receive the teachings of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the study that we've been doing this week, would we say that Eli was a good father? Was he a good high priest? Was he a good man? If we contrast him with Hannah, do we see a difference in how they approached the rearing of their children? In this way, you may become truly converted. I entreat you not make it necessary for God to afflict you by withdrawing his blessing from you. He will withdraw the blessing that is treated by you as though yours by right, <clears throat> for you have made it a hindrance rather than a help. The Lord who gave his life for you and for your children has left this command. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. What does this tell us? What does this show us? Here in the book of John, we are being told to search the scriptures. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the publicans, all were told to search the scriptures. Those who do not earnestly cultivate spirituality by accepting light and walking in the light will find that the light they already have will become darkness. Is that what we desire today? Is this where we wish to find ourselves, is in darkness? No. Thank you. Unless we continually feel the necessity of praying to our Heavenly Father for wisdom, unless we search the scriptures to know the way of the Lord and to be kept by the power of God, then it will become easy to drift further and further away from God and to unite our interests with that of those who know not the love of the truth. We need spirituality in order to discharge our duties in the fear of God. The Bible tells us that when men deliberately turn away from God, the Lord turns away from them. When the Jews did this, the Lord said, Therefore I scattered them, with a whirlwind among all the nations. Again, the Lord says, <clears throat> them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. 1 Samuel 2.30. In preparing the papers for the study in 1 Samuel 2, it was very surprising to me 
that there are 27 pages of quotations in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy just on this one verse, 1 Samuel 2.30. Now, why would Mrs. White be bidden to write so much on a verse like this? Why are we seeing that she is giving this kind of an admonition? And the, the interesting thing for me is it wasn't the same thing over and over again. Here she states, this is simply a declaration of the effect of a cause, the necessary result of a certain course of action. The sun of righteousness will shine upon those who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. He says, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John eight twelve. So if we set aside light that comes to us, even with all the light that we've seen in the past, and now we are setting aside the light, what's going to happen to us? As she says here, we will walk in darkness. Can we afford to set aside any light that has come to us? No. Manuscript 69A, 1896. Unless there is a most earnest, decided purpose to cultivate our own spirituality to a higher degree, accepting light, the light we already have, becomes darkness. Unless there is constant necessity felt for prayer to our Heavenly Father for his wisdom and a searching of the scriptures to know his way and be kept by the power of God, then it will become very easy to drift farther and farther away from God and unite our interest with those who know not the truth and who will not accept the truth. We need spirituality to discharge our duties daily in the fear of God. The Bible history tells us that when men deliberately turn away from the message of God and the messages he sends them, the Lord turns away from them. What is the result? Therefore I scattered them with a whirlwind among all nations. He that honoreth me, I will honor. He that despiseth me and the message I send, I will lightly esteem. This is not making God a hard master. It is simply a declaration of the effect of the cause and eternal necessity of results. Can we properly reason from cause to effect? Are we able without scripture without the spirit of prophecy to see the issues that arise within our own life? Are we capable without scripture of being able to truly understand what's going on within our own lives? The son of righteousness will shine upon all who will follow Christ. They that follow me shall not walk in darkness. We belong to Christ. He has bought us, bought our children. We can educate them to think more highly of earthly pleasures and earthly treasures than of the heavenly. If we give the world all the advantage of of obtaining mind, heart, and soul service, every chink is filled. The worldly tide fills every space, and the word of God is left out. The bright light proceeding from Christ is not admitted. The spirit, the principles that dwell in the heart of the disobedient, dwell in the heart of those who link up in harmony with them. It is our choice. What are we going to honor? Who should we honor? Should we honor our creator? Or should we honor our adversary? If we honor our adversary, we choose to honor ourselves. If we honor ourselves, our worship is fruitless. My attention has been called to the last books of the Old Testament. I was directed to bid the people of God take heed how they hear and what they do. These scriptures make special reference to the last days, when Bible history will be unfolded. They are brought to our notice those who are not walking in the way of the Lord, but are following deceptive leadings. From the word, we are to learn the will of God. 
for the guidance of our own course of action and in these last days. Let your minds take in the subject. Read and consider and be instructed. Light was given to me in regard to this time. Reproof came because places of worship had been accepted and that discredited our work in the place of magnifying it. The Lord has resources. His hand is on the machinery. When the time came for his temple to be rebuilt, he moved upon Cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself and to grant the Jewish people their liberty. And more, Cyrus furnished them the necessity, the necessary facilities for rebuilding the temple of the Lord. The work began under Cyrus and his successor carried on the work begun. Which would be Cambyses. Go ahead. That would be Cambyses. Correct. So in history, we have Cyrus to Cambyses. Cambyses is followed by false Smyrtus, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand. So Cyrus furnished them the necessary facilities to rebuild the temple of the Lord. This work began under Cyrus and his successor, which would be Cambyses, carried on the work begun. That's what I understand that's being said there. Anyway, it's just me, you know, trying to figure out the sentence exactly what it means. Well, we should try that all the time. Yeah. Shouldn't we? Yeah. Now, we know the work is going to stop under false smirtus and then resume under Darius. So. What perfect harmony with this statement is there in the words of the Apostle Paul? When writing to the Ephesians, read the fourth chapter of Ephesians carefully with a heart to understand the words of God has spoken by his apostles and prophets. The very testimonies given in the Old Testament are given in the new. Mark how the words of the Apostle Paul bring before the mind loyalty to the law of God when he enjoins upon all to keep if they would live in them and to have the blessings which comes to all that are obedient. In neglecting the temple, which is the mirror of my presence, God says, you dishonor me by sacredly regarding God's house, not as did the Jews in the days of Christ because of its magnificent, but because God has promised that he will be there. The Lord is honored. If those who assemble to worship, God will put away sin, and all unrighteousness, the pure believing hearts of the worshipers will not be like those represented in Zechariah. Where is God to dwell today? Let us remember, God dwelt among his people, first in the tabernacle, then in the temple. But where did they find God? Where was the manifestation of God? Well, they could see him in in the fire and cloud, but mainly they're supposed to be searching him with their whole hearts. Like, how is he moving in our lives? When first the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they would see the manifestation of his power in the fire and the clouds. I agree. When it came to the tabernacle and then to the temple, where was the manifestation of God? Was it not above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies? Yes, but most folks were not allowed in there. So, it, again, you have to search for him spiritually. You have to have, have a desire to know God. But symbol- That's how I came to Christ. Is there a God? If there is a God, if there is a Christ, please reveal yourself to me. Symbolically, with the power of the Almighty being shown, above the mercy seat, in the most holy. Does this not show us that God desires to grant mercy to all that will truly come to him? Amen. But in order to see him, we must go spiritually into the holy of holies. Zechariah 7, 11 to 14 is now quoted. They refused to hearken, and they pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, and they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, 
lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophecies. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. If we're not willing to hear the law, if we are not here willing to hear the law and the statutes, are we not just like those at the time of Zechariah? Therefore, it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate. And them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. These words are very impressive. The Lord calls upon dew and rain and the varied agencies of nature, and they obey the his call to be used either in blessings or in judgments. They are under his control. Inanimate nature is represented as being shocked at man's disregard for God's word. God calls for famine and plague and pestilence, for calamities by sea and by land, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The things of nature spring in response to the word of God to do his bidding, either in wasting or destruction or in mercies and blessings. How many people do you think there are in Florida today that are praising God for the hur this new hurricane that's hitting? How many do you think there are there currently that are viewing this as a punishment for the iniquity of the people? Is that not what this paragraph says to us? What else does it say? If we look and we consider the words that are placed before us, how striking is the contrast between the things of nature, the material agencies, and the tardy inattention and slothful disobedience of men, those for whom Christ has died. Saith the Lord, ye have let my house be, lie waste, and I will send on all that is yours a wasting drought. This reaches not only the first of the ground, but the living creatures. The cattle must suffer because of the sins of men. What do you think about that statement? How can we apply that to ourselves today? All the fruits of the land, the vineyards, the corn, the gardens, God sent to the remnant people according to all that he commanded Zechariah to speak. From Manuscript 164 of 1899, we read, And the Lord and the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Verses 8 through 10. The teaching was the opposite to the course of action which the people had been pursuing, and they were displeased with it. They wanted to follow their own wisdom. In the 10th verse of the 7th chapter, the prophet is represented as addressing the men whose course of action was as evil leaven among the people, his hand placed upon their shoulder in earnest entreaty. But they refused to hearken, and they pulled away the shoulder, and they stopped their ears that they would not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the word which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. And what was the result? Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it came to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them as a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. The prophet Nehemiah presents the evil doings of the Jewish nation as the cause of their calamities. Now, who was Nehemiah speaking to? Was he not speaking directly to the remnant that had returned from Babylon? After detailing the Lord's dealing with them and their oft rebellion, 
their continual rebellion. The prophet says, so the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hand with their kings and the people of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, walls dig, wells dig, excuse me, vineyards and olive yards and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to flee. And they wrought great provocations. Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hands of their enemies so that they had the dominion over them. Brothers and sisters, do we today want to be delivered into the hands of these that mock us, that tell us all of the imaginary sins that we have done and telling us how what terrible people we are? Is this where we want to be? No, sometimes we're mocked for what appear to be or really are our true sins too. So I would rather be mocked for trying to glorify Christ than for things I've done in the past. Okay. These husbandmen lived not to please God and to do his will, but to please themselves. Had they heeded the word of the Lord, had they respected his warnings, they would have been saved the sorrows and the disasters which came upon them. Now, this is an interesting promise. Here we are shown that these husbandmen, these tenders of the vine, Live not to please God. Why do you tend the vine? To get better fruit. Well, but to bring forth fruit. Amen. Okay. But to get better, what kind of fruit? Well, grapes. Unless and, it's a vine. Okay. Selfish, selfish fruit. Selfish fruit. So if it is grapes, what what is the fruit of the grape? What does it become? Well... Wine, juice, alcohol. Yep. Well, it doesn't necessarily become alcohol. Um, but it's alcohol, it's alcohol in it. It's alcohol in it. In in grape juice, there's alcohol oh, in fermented fermented grape juice. Yeah, I mean there is actually alcohol in every fruit, but not very much. But there is some. So, in this situation. Symbolically, what does the wine represent? Paul doctrine. Right. Had these ministers lived not to please God and to do his will, but to please themselves? Had they heeded the word of the Lord? Had they respected his warnings? They would have been saved from the sorrows and the disasters which come upon them. If we are going to study line upon line, precept upon precept, we are going to be able to determine doctrine. If we are then properly sharing that doctrine, we have done that which Christ would have us to do. But if we are going to choose to live for ourselves, to gratify ourselves, are we then going to be the husbandmen that are living not to please God? We have a huge decision to make. Well, Christ said, he that saveth his life 
shall lose it. So if you're building your house on sand and trying to please yourself and leaving God on, and, and others out of the equation, then you're already lost. Right. When one of God's instrumentalities, which is engaged in doing his work, shall through some lack of judgment fall into decay, let those institutions which are in a more prosperous condition do to the uttermost of their ability to lift the crippled institution to its feet, that the name of God be not dishonored. We need every faculty, every facility that is in Europe to stand in a healthy, wholesome condition before an ungodly world. Let not the angels of God who are ministering unto those who bear the responsibilities see the hearts of God's workers made sad. Already the difficulties have increased by delay, so that it will be a greater expense to cure the, bu the bruises and the wounds of the institution. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldiah, of Tobijah, and of Jedidiah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day. And go into the house of jo Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, and take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon a he the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be to Helam, and to Tobijah, and to Jedidiah, and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come, and build in this temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. In the name of the Lord, we ask his people who have the means to arise and realize that God, who is the owner of all property, which his believing ones possess, shall prove themselves faithful stewards of God. Repair the condition of God's working machinery, that the hearts of God's people shall not be made sad. Here, again, Mrs. White quotes Zechariah 7, 1 through 10, where she is showing that this came to pass in the fourth year of Darius. In the fourth day of the ninth month, as it says here in Chislun, which should be Chislu. Which is Kislev in Kislev. Yep. Modern, modern way that it's understood, Kislev. Okay. Yeah. So we have a date on which this is occurring. Fourth year of Darius, fourth day of the ninth month in Kislev. So we are in the fall of the year, the fourth well, day of the ninth it's month. More, it's more the, the winter. It's more. in December. Okay. Here again, we are told to execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in his heart. I cannot think that the closing part of this chapter will be the course that you will pursue. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in by his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them.
that no man passed through nor returned. For they laid the pleasant land desolate. Talk not words of censure. Lay not the blame upon this one or upon that one. It's interesting to me. Here in this manuscript, we are told we are not to blame others for the calamities that are befalling us. But don't we see this happening all the time? It is a fact that there is now need of the help which all can bring to heal the breach that has been made. Do it cheerfully. Do it nobly. Come up to the help of the Lord, to the help of of the Lord against the mighty. Redeem at once the institution that is in great peril. This can be done if we all will take hold and redeem this heavily debt burden institution. And in doing this, the blessing of the Lord will be upon you. It can be done, and in the name of the Lord, lay hold of it. Let all work with courage and with cheerfulness and with joy. And this very work will prove a great blessing in the experience of all who lay hold upon it and carry it through successfully. These words were written 124 years ago. How should we be approaching these things now? We have been extending the hand of fellowship to many others that have, over the years, criticized any that would join in this meeting. It is such a sad situation. And we continue continue to do that. Right. Regardless. Manuscript 64, 1902. And I... If I may, yeah, I just had a thought that, you know, I had my guys working for me. Often they would come to me, no, not often, because I did did uh, train them. But sometimes they would come to me with a problem, and I would tell them, well, I'm aware of the problem. Can you help me find a solution? And so right now it sounds like we're finding a lot of problems or the problem come to us with a solution as well. But how can we solve this? And and in in that they become a more valuable employee and they also feel better about it themselves because they feel like they are contributing. So with that example or idea of teaching so can we think of how we can solve this? Because it, it is an obvious problem. We, we do see it. How, how can we solve this? How can the Lord solve this through us or with us? Well, I've asked that question many times. So all that God has ever showed me is that um, I need to continue studying his word and living up to the light I have and focusing upon the things that I can can control and leaving in his hands the things I can't. But that doesn't really solve the problem, at least not in the short term. I think we should pray each day that as God is working in our lives, help us not to hinder his working in our lives. We should be praying the same thing for those who are opposed to us Mm -hmm. and who are excluding us. Because unless they change, unless they see the need to unite under the Holy Spirit, it isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Each of us have a responsibility. We may see, my apology, we may see sin in all of those around us. Yet, are we being like the adamant stone? and reflecting our own sin upon them. There are many times in my life when my mother would say to me, the faults you see in others are those that you most need to correct in yourself. And that has been a very hard thing to have to accept. We need to amen. commit. Excuse Go ahead, Kelly. I was just amening or agreeing with what you said there. That's a wholehearted amen. Okay. We at times 
find it much easier to tell others where their faults are rather than looking and accepting our own faults. Yeah, and it's especially the the things about others that annoy us the most. Right. Right. I mean, it's one thing, you know, you can see a sin, but when you're really, that person really annoys you, you should t- kind of take a look at yourself. Why are you annoyed? No. And it could just be more than annoyance. Just when when the sins of others create a reaction in you of any kind, um, you have to try to analyze what is that reaction about. I mean, there there can be good reactions, obviously, where you see that they're hurting themselves or others. But, you know, we need to figure out why why that particular person or sin really bothers us. And often it's because there's something unresolved in our own lives. We don't we don't even call it sin sometimes. I mean, oh, man, I just, just did. I just did two and a half months of this stuff, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a I had a counselor that. He drove me crazy. Like he'd interrupt me in things, and okay, no, no, we're, we're not talking about them right now, Kelly. What what's going on for you? How are you feeling right now? What are you thinking? Where are you feeling it in your body? Even he, you know, this mindfulness awareness thing. Well, I feel it in my my uh, temples, and my neck is throbbing, or my gut is in a knot, or. Okay, well, where's that feeling coming from? What are you thinking about? Like, and self-examination is not an easy thing. It's it can be difficult, and and, and it's easy, like we say, you know, it's easy to look out, but it's through the Holy Spirit only, I believe, mm-hmm. that that we can really see inside and what's bugging us and and then to bring it to harness it to change it now that's through the holy spirit those impulsive or sinful thoughts and feelings are brought under the control of reason and conscience reason being our own minds the frontal lobes and conscience being the Holy Spirit. So there again, we have humanity and divinity combined. And that's the process of sanctification. That, that's been my experience in the last 10 weeks. So these are some of the tools I came away with. Now, put them into practice, as I've shared with you, Theodore, in conversations. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah. But, but that's it. They nailed it in, in treatment for me. Yeah. Well, and it's such a simple idea, right? I mean, it's it's not it's not it's not very complex, and yet you know we well, fail. Sometimes, it, yeah. Sometimes the simple is well, often the simple is the most difficult. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we'd like to make it more difficult, so so we don't have to deal with ourselves. Kind of remind me of this one experience I had when I was living in the Turner home. Down in that basement, you know, there was that other bathroom down there and the bathtub. (laughs) And uh, I remember thinking that I wanted, I don't know, there was some sin that that I wanted to overcome. And so I thought, I know, I'm just going to take cold baths. (laughs) I was going to flagellate the flesh just like Luther or something, you know. (laughs) I tried that for a few times and I'm like, I don't like this idea, <laughs> but yeah, trying to make it more difficult. Yeah. Or somehow we get, well, I don't know what you mean by trying to make it more difficult. Well, what I'm but, saying is that you, you try to complicate the problem instead of actually looking at the simple solution. Right. So. Um, do we try? You know, I, I, to complicate? People, you know, that's too difficult. It's too hard. Right. You know, people are too complex. The situation's more complex than you make it out to be. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And okay, but but I really think that the the, the solution, you know, comes with us and God. Just being honest with with God about the difficulties that we are having and recognizing one is it does take time. 
right? It's not easy, but but it is simple. There, it's not a complex psychological issue to understand that uh, the sins I see in others are really the things that I don't want to see in myself. It's, it's a pretty simple idea. Correct. I yeah. know Christ would go into a secluded area with his disciples. Um, get away, get away from it all. Yeah, it's just we act like there's some like you know such sudden complex solution to these problems, right? That that is so far beyond us that you know that we have to, you know, we must, you know, we have to have like a degree in psychology or something in order to understand just the simple things that that we do. And and in reality, I think a lot of these things are an avoidance of the simple solution. Right. Religion can be that. Well. It can be a way of avoiding having to deal with who you are. So, you know, people become religious in order to avoid, you know, changing. Right. They can change certain types of things about themselves and they think that that's going to to be enough rather than dealing with the root issues. And because those root, root issues are extremely painful. But it's not too painful and it's not too difficult. Not dealing with those problems is worse. I mean, we're miserable when we don't deal with the reality of who we are. Right. You know. Uh, I'm thinking of simple in terms of uh, uh, scripture and, and the spirit of prophecy. Put it when we, when there's relationship difficulties is, you know, go to our go to our brother or friend or whoever go to that person mm -hmm. and admit our part and ask for forgiveness and, and and that's often even just that figuring out what is our part sometimes we can't even see it just going to that person and saying i'm sorry you know i, I value this relationship more than whatever the problem is and i'm just sorry that, that we're having this difficulty and leave it at that without expecting or waiting for that other person to see their part or trying to show them their part or to, trying to show other people their sin that that doesn't work well that's yeah. you know that's when the def defenses come up but yeah and then just leaving it there and then the, how, how do we see jesus do that like i'm just trying to think of an example how did jesus do that and how does he do that with us to reconcile the relationship with with him with God. But well, he how takes, does he do that? He takes the blame blame upon himself, even though he's not to blame. I mean, I've had people say, right. "How can I apologize when I don't think that I'm in the wrong? I'm pretty sure they're in the wrong." <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, you can't do anything about them. But you can't do something about you, and yeah. and so yeah. And it's not doesn't have caveats attached to it, you know, you know, like, well, you know, I'm sorry I was mad at you, but you just make me mad. And, and uh, or, you know, I'm sorry that you think I did this thing. <laughs> right. You just have to, you know, I've seen a lot of bad apologies. I, I've received some, but I've seen other people mm -hmm. give as well, uh, you know, to others. I, I can't imagine That's a that. hallmark. I don't think I've ever given a bad apology, not that I can think of. <laughs> that sounds like a bad apology about apologies. <laughs> no, I, I'm um, sure I sometimes have had insincere apologies. But but if I recognize that my actions have hurt somebody, it doesn't really matter what my motives were, right? Yeah, I can still yeah they're hurt. Yeah. The relationship is damaged. Any apology that includes but is not a sincere apology, if you ask me. I, I'm sorry, but, you know, just leave that out. Try to leave or, that out in an apology and see how it goes. Or an apology that really puts the blame upon the other person for how you, how they made you feel. <laughs> you made I'm me feel... sorry you hurt my feet. Yeah. I, I've seen some really bad ones, but... Um, you know, the secret there is if you never apologize, you can never do a bad apology, which is probably. Well, you, you, you bring up something else, too, that, you know, okay, you made me feel. Yeah. 
you made me angry. You made me jealous. You made me whatever. Well, man, if I can make you feel something, I'm pretty powerful. I'm living in your head. I, I don't put anger in someone. It, I might, I might push a button, and and they get angry. But that anger comes from with within us. Look, Jesus said, "What did he say about that which cometh from a man inside corrupts him?" How does that go again? I don't know. Anyway, we're gonna have to move on because like, we went off on a rabbit trail, did we? You know what the Russians? You know what the Russians? You know what the Russians say about chasing two rabbits? If you chase two rabbits, you will catch neither. Okay, let's get off the rabbit Russian rabbit trail. Yeah. But yeah, it was good though. But yeah, I think the basic idea here simply is I don't have any control over anybody else's actions, only my own. And so when we look at the situation that has occurred in this movement, you know, we we take responsibility for our actions and we don't excuse our actions because of someone else's action and we we have to leave things in god's hands if we change ourselves if if we're just looking to fix the problem without any change in ourselves then the problem's not going to be fixed but anyway the next study is going to be pretty interesting so dwight if you want to close this study with prayer then we'll start my study you ready well yeah you can close your the study with prayer and then i'll start mine okay Thank you, each one, for your comments today. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, please forgive us of our sins. Please help us so that we may recognize the sin that is within us and help us to draw closer to our brothers and sisters. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon the study that is to follow this one. Direct us now and be with us in all ways through these Sabbath hours. For this, Father, we thank you, and for this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.